You may be seated. The only one I saw dancing was Little Dove, the baby over here. I saw her dancing. She's got some moves, more moves than I got. Uh, the next few weeks that I'm preaching anyway, they'll be scattered out over the, the next few months. Uh, we're going to do a series on the men who carried the fire, the prophets, the lives of the prophets. I didn't know much about them, and what I did learn fell out of my brain uh, a long time ago. It's hard to keep track of those guys, so we want to take some time in the next few months and go through all the minor prophets and more uh, an emphasis on their life, the life of the prophet as much as what he actually said. We want to look at his life and the context. And the goal is so that when we read these books in the future through our Bible in a year, or maybe you're going to take on one of the prophets for your personal devotion life and you're going to study it, uh, you have a little bit more context and you can uh, gleam a little bit more of the truth as you know the history and the context and what the man's life was like. We're going to try to go in chronological order, and the first one that we can see, uh, there's some discrepancy as far as the dates, but Jonah is one of the earliest prophets to have prophesied to the nation of Israel. So if you'd like to uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah, I'll give you a minute to turn there. We're going to read a lot of the passage, so if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to turn there. Uh, but we want to take a look at Jonah's life, Jonah chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 3 uh, in just a moment, and then we'll read chapter 4, verse 2 to get started. Uh, but these prophets, there's a great, rich context. And many times what we see in the life of the prophets, at least as far as Jonah's concerned, is Jonah's working on the man, the prophet, as much as he's working on the people that he's preaching to or prophesying to. And we see Jonah sent. Many of you know the story, right? How many of you are vaguely familiar with the story of Jonah, right? The big fish or the whale. And people say, oh, he was followed by a whale. And the people who are too smart for their own good say, well, it wasn't a whale. It was a big fish. It was a huge fish of some kind that swallowed Jonah and then spit him back out because he was trying to run from God's calling on his life. And so we're going to study that here this morning. And I look forward to sharing this time with you. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read it. If you can listen in or go ahead and read it along with me. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amnity, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And he paid the fare and he went down to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so we see that's the beginning. He gets this calling, go to Nineveh, preach. And he says, I don't want to go there. And he starts heading in the opposite direction. Uh, he's heading, if you can see a map, uh, Nineveh would be, let's see, from your perspective, over here. No, either way, over here on the map, about as far to the edge of the page as you can get. And Tarshish is on the southern tip of Spain, as far the opposite direction as you can get. It was a, a shipping town where they would go, uh, to, it was like a gateway to the west, and he was going as far as he could possibly go because he knew the end result of him preaching to the Ninevites, which he eventually would do, and I'm going to spoil the ending for you, so if you don't know the story and you don't want to know, tune me out, put your, your fingers in your ears, and go la, la, la for just a moment. Um, but I think most of you know where this is headed. Chapter 4, verse 2, after he preaches to Nineveh, and they repent, and God spares them, God doesn't pour out his judgment on them. Jonah says to the Lord at that point, so Jonah prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh, Lord, I knew that this was what was going to happen when I was back in my own country. Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I knew that you are gracious, that you are merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. So Jonah preaches. He accomplishes the mission. The people repent, and they're saved by God's grace and mercy, and he's upset about this. Why would he be upset if Jonah knew that God was gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, then why was he so upset? Because we see at the end, he said, God, I knew you would do this. And then it says in a few verses later, we'll read it in a bit, that he's angry. I'm angry about this. And God says, do you have a right to be angry? And Jonah, like a child, he says, yes, I do have a right to be angry. He's angry about all this. Why was Jonah so angry? Why did he run from the calling of God? Why did he not want to see these people forgiven? Our first point this morning is the bondage of bitterness. Jonah was bitter. He had a hatred for the people in Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians were currently at war with Israel. I wouldn't know if I'd call it much of a war. The Assyrians would come and they would raid the unwalled villages and towns and 
take the women slaves and beat the children. They were incredibly cruel. They would kill the men. They would besiege fortified cities and walled cities and take them down too. It wasn't much of a war. I mean, Israel was just getting trampled by the Assyrians, and Nineveh was their capital city. They were conquering lands, the Assyrians were. They were taking slaves. The Assyrians were exceedingly cruel, according to their own historical writings. In the, in the, the historical writings of the Assyrians, we see that they would make pyramids out of human heads of those that they had conquered. They would cut the hands and the feet off of women and children just to make a point of how cruel they were and that they are a people to be feared. They bragged about their expanse of mass graves, saying there's not enough earth for us to bury those whom we have killed. Very cruel, very evil people, very violent. And they had actually taken Jonah's hometown by the Sea of Galilee. And Jonah had a lot of his own friends and family members become the victims of the Assyrians and of the people of Nineveh. So when God said, go preach to the people of Nineveh, Jonah said, that's not going to happen. I don't care what it takes. I am not going to see those people. I don't want to have anything to do with them. I think it was more out of bitterness and anger and wanting them to receive the judgment of God more than it was out of fear for his own life. And Assyria eventually did conquer Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, the capital was Samaria. The capital fell in 722 B.C. And Jonah did not want to see these people forgiven. Jonah felt like his own forgiveness was, was worth, he was worth being forgiven, that he was a good man, that he walked with God, that he was righteous, that he was just, and he felt like the Assyrians did not deserve the forgiveness of God. But how many of you know none of us deserve the forgiveness of God? I had a friend when I first moved here from upstate New York to Southern California. It was many, I don't know, 17, 18 years ago. My first friend wasn't the brightest guy in the world, but he was a good friend. He wasn't very academically sharp or uh, very intelligent, but he was a nice, nice guy. He was my neighbor. And I remember one day he called me. Uh, he said, hey, I'm, I'm at the beach, man. And I said, oh, that's, that's cool. How, how's it going? He said, yeah, my friend brought me to the beach, man. He's in a meeting, but I'm just at the beach, man. I said, oh, that's awesome. Is it your first time at the ocean? Because he sounded so excited. And he said, yeah, it's my first time, man. I said, what do you think? What do you think of the ocean? He said, it's a lot of water, man. I said, yeah, it's a lot of water. And he said, I was thinking, man, Japan's out there somewhere, man. I said, yeah, it's out there. He said, I was thinking, man, I've never been to Japan. Maybe I'll try to swim to Japan. I said, don't do that. You will die. You can't make it. And he was, I think he was seriously considering, I bet he was standing right at the edge of the ocean, ready to put his phone down and go for a swim. I said, don't do that. There is a good chance that you will die unless someone saves you. Seriously, don't do that. I was really concerned. Like, I stood up on the phone. I was telling him, don't do this. And he said, yeah, I guess I won't do it. That's okay, man. I said, yeah, don't do it. He said, yeah, that's all right. I don't know how to swim anyway, man. I'm not joking. But you know, what would be the difference between him and Michael Phelps both trying to swim to Japan? Maybe a matter of an hour or two. Neither of them are going to make it. Both of them need a ship or a plane or something. They're not going to make it. And I think Jonah felt like, you know what, I deserve this, but they don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. It doesn't matter how great of a swimmer we are or how righteous we think we are. God's grace is God's grace, and God's mercy is God's mercy. And Jonah's heart was so bitter towards the Assyrians and the people of Nineveh that he said, I don't want those people to receive God's grace and mercy, and I know that God is gracious and merciful, and if they turn and repent, he'll forgive them, and I don't want to see that happen. I hate those people. Look what they've done to my people. I hate them. And bitterness, we see in Acts chapter 8, verse 23, will poison your heart. It'll totally ruin your heart and soul from the inside out. Bitterness leads you in Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. Jonah, when he's in the fish, he says, Those who regard worthless idols, they forsake their own mercy. Now he's talking a little bit about himself. His bitterness and his anger had become an idol in his life. It had become over uh, the power of God. He had placed it above God. And it sort of became an idol in his life. Placing anger over God or bitterness over God, that becomes like idolatry. Chasing what is empty. You can never really achieve the end goal of your bitterness. You're just going to continue growing more angry and more bitter until we turn back to God and grant forgiveness and we find that grace and mercy. It's vain to chase after bitterness. It's vain to let that seed of unforgiveness grow. And then it says, most importantly, we forsake our own mercy. Jonah had realized that the bitterness in his heart had caused him to forsake the mercy of God in his own life. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 teaches us that we need to forgive others so that we will be forgiven. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. 
They asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone? Seven. And what did Jesus say? A little arithmetic for him. Seven times 70. Every day. Continue to forgive. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 is teaching if, if you're praying or you're in the temple and you're seeking the Lord and then you remember you have something against your brother, leave your offering, leave what you're doing, and go be reconciled and then come back. God places a high, a high value on forgiveness, on letting go, not allowing our heart to become bitter, but Jonah's heart had become bitter. Bitterness will cost you the very presence of God. He was trying to run from God. I know we can never fully escape his presence, and God kept chasing after Jonah. God was not going to let Jonah out of his presence, but Jonah was pushing the mercy of God away because he didn't want to see others forgiven. If we have bitterness in our heart or anger or unforgiveness, maybe it's out of control right now and, and you know it, and it needs to be dealt with. Deal with it today. Maybe it's just a seed and it's just beginning, but you know it's there. You're sensitive to the Holy Spirit in your heart, and you know you're harboring some of that in your heart and in your life, and it needs to be dealt with before it grows out of control. I hate going to the dentist. My wife loves going to the dentist. I think there's something wrong with that. Does anyone here love going to the dentist? Like, yeah, dentist day. Oh, it makes my teeth feel all clean, right? No one's raising their hand, but I see some of you looking at your husband or wife or friend saying, I do, I like the dentist. You just don't want to admit it, like, to the whole group, because it's weird. But I, I go every six months because I know I'm prone to cavities. My teeth are all crammed in there, and I get cavities a lot. When I go to the dentist, one cavity is a pretty good day. Two and three, that's a bad day. But the last time I went, dentist said, you have no cavities. I put my hands up in the air like I just scored a touchdown. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, no cavities. And he said, he was joking. He said, I think it's because we filled all the places you could possibly get a cavity already. But you know what, I've never had a root canal, I've never had a serious infection, and you know, people with a lot better smiles than me have. You know, because they let that little cavity grow and it gets deeper and the infection gets deeper and deeper. I would deal with them often, early and often, so I wouldn't have any major problems. You know, I have friends that, you know, they close down this side of their mouth because they can't chew anymore, it just hurts, and then they start chewing on this side, and then they can't chew on that side anymore because it hurts, and then they start having to chew down the middle like a rabbit. And then eventually they go in and find, oh, you need this root canal, we need to do this and that and all this stuff. I would go often enough. I'm not perfect, you know, but I would go often enough where we'd catch it early. It wouldn't be a big deal. And bitterness, anger, unforgiveness is a lot like that. If we go often into the presence of God and say, God, I'm angry. You know, I'm feeling this in my heart. I have this towards my friend or my brother, sister, family member, coworker. Lord, I need to have this dealt with right now. Jonah let it grow out of control, and I don't know that we could blame him, but for the sake of application, let's be people who check our hearts regularly, who don't allow that bitterness to grow. So why did God choose Jonah? Were there no other righteous men? Couldn't he have found a man who was fasting and praying for the Assyrians to see them saved, to see them living in grace and mercy, to see them reconciled and come to, to a good relationship with those in Israel? Couldn't he have found a worthy preacher, someone who wasn't so angry or bitter? He probably could have. Why did he choose Jonah? We see in Jonah 1.1, simply Jonah had a relationship with God. So he had that going. But I believe that God was working on Jonah's heart just like he wanted to work in the lives of the Assyrian people. Right? We see Jonah always going because the Assyrians, they need to, to receive God's grace. They need to turn or they're going to be facing God's judgment. But God chose Jonah, a very bitter man, a very angry man, to do this because God loved Jonah. And God wanted to work in Jonah's life. He wanted to heal the wounds in Jonah's heart. Jonah was a man of God, but he needed a lot of work. I think that's a lot like most, if not all of us. People who love the Lord, but God still has work to do. Jonah needed to face those who hurt him. He couldn't keep running. And, and God calls him to face those who had hurt him. And there's a time and there's a place for each one of us that when someone has hurt us, there's that time to face them with forgiveness. To say, I'm granting this forgiveness. I'm not holding on to this anymore. Are there people who have hurt you? Are you allowing that bitterness to infect your heart? Because bitterness will lead you to that form of idolatry where we start to place our own anger and our own feelings above God. It'll lead us to live a life of vanity, constantly stewing on anger rather than doing the things that the Lord has for us. And it will lead us to rebellion as Jonah ran, didn't want to be in the presence of God, did not want to accomplish the calling of God in his life. That's rebellion. Bitterness and anger will ruin your relationship with God. It will ruin 
our relationships with others as well. But God is full of grace. He's full of mercy. He wants to work in the lives of those who have hurt you. But he also wants to work in your life as well, doesn't he? A lot of times, and as far as I'm concerned, it's more about God working on me than what he's going to do in the lives of those who have hurt me. But God is full of grace and mercy. What are the results of running? When God calls us to something and we live in rebellion and say, I don't want to do that. I won't grant forgiveness. I won't let it go. What are the results? Let's go ahead and read. I will pick it up in chapter 1, verse 4. We're going to read the rest of the chapter together. So if you'd like to follow along. But the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Let's not underestimate what that means. I mean, the waves were crashing, and the ship, they're afraid the ship is going to start falling apart. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man called out to his God, and they threw the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship. He laid down, and he was fast asleep. Is that a normal thing to be doing at that point in time? See, we're about to die, so I'm just going to go down to the lowest, darkest part of the ship. I'm just going to go to sleep. The captain, in verse 6, came to him and said, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us that we may not die. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose trouble, uh, for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what are your people like? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea, and he made the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and they said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. And they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more temp tempestuous. Excuse me. And he said to them, pick, up and pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will be calm for you. Another verse we don't want to underestimate. What did that mean when Jonah said, Throw me into the sea? That's essentially a what? That's a death sentence. Jonah was willing to die. Not for a noble cause. I mean, really, he didn't want those guys to be harmed. But really, I think he had just given up. Let's continue on. We'll touch base on that in a moment. Nevertheless, the men rode. They tried hard to reach dry land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more violent against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord, and the Lord said, uh, and they said, uh, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with this man's innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, and they threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they took vows. And the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, and then Jonah prayed to the Lord from the belly of the fish. What are the results of running? We see here in this case, Jonah thought he could escape God. But we know he couldn't. Doesn't it, isn't it interesting that when he got to Joppa, what was ready to roll? He got there just in time. It was all ready to go. What was there ready waiting for him? A ship. It was ready to go. You know, when you want to be in rebellion from God, there's always an easy way out, isn't there? When you're on a diet, there's always a lot more fast food restaurants on your route to work. When you want to fall into sin or you want to be pushing, pushing God away, there's always an easy way out. And that was the easy way out there for Jonah. I remember one time a while back, I was supposed to be fasting, and I was dropping off lunch for a Christian club at school. I had 12 pizzas in my car, and I realized I got there 30 minutes early because it was a testing day, and they changed the schedule. And I sat in my car for 30 minutes with 12 boxes of pizza on the day I was supposed to be fasting. We all know how that story ended. I'm not proud of that day. But it's easy. It seems like whenever you're trying to get on track with the Lord... Or whenever you want to find a way out, it just seems like it's right there. We need to keep our guard up. We need to be ready to continue to resist those evil temptations. He was going to Tarshish, that southern tip of Spain. It was the gateway to the west. It was as far as possible. It was a place where there would be no Israelites. None of his people would be there. What does that mean? There was no accountability. No one knew Jonah there. No one really knew of Jonah's God there. No one knew the calling on Jonah's life there. He said, if I can get there, I'm not accountable for anything. 
That's a dangerous place, and God did not want him to go there. We need accountability. It was a place where he thought God would not follow him. So he thought it was a place he would have no responsibility. No accountability, no responsibility. It's possible, we don't know this for sure, that his view of God was too small. He may have thought God of like a tribal, territorial God. Maybe not. Maybe he knew God was totally God, sovereign of the universe. But we see that as he's on the ship and he realizes, I can't escape. Look what God is doing to the ocean. Look what God is doing to the sea. Look at this storm. And what does he say to the people? They say, who are you? Who is your God? He says, I serve Yahweh, the God of Israel. He's the God of the sea. He's the God of the land. I think Jonah was realizing at that point, even if I get there, he created this whole thing, and I can't outrun him. There's no borders or there's no territories that God is not willing to go to. I think Jonah might have been realizing that. Jonah was a man, a faithful man of God, but he may have been realizing in that moment how great God was. I serve God, the God of heaven. He's the God. He made the sea, and he made the land. There's nowhere that I can escape his presence. But what did it cost him, all this running? He thought he could escape. We see it cost him time. It cost him resources. It may have cost him some of his health. It says he paid the fare to get on the ship, so it cost him some money there. But more importantly, what did they throw overboard when the ship was maybe starting to sink? They threw all the stuff. What did Jonah have with him? Was he going for a weekend getaway and planning to come back? I think Jonah was gone. I think he took everything that was important to him, definitely everything he would need on the trip, and that was probably most, if not all, of his possessions. Anything he could carry, he took with him, and now it's floating in the ocean, floating in the sea. Cost him his, his money, cost him his possessions, cost the other sailors their possessions as well, as well. Cost Jonah time. He spent 60 miles traveling to Joppa to get to that seaport, and then however much time they were on the sea, he nearly drowned. It cost him some of his health as uh, legend has it that his skin was bleached from being in that, in that fish. We can't prove that. We don't know that. But nonetheless, Jonah was back where he started, as we see uh, in chapter 2, verse 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. It was funny when I was writing my notes. I had to double check. I've never had to check this before. Does the word vomited have one T or two? I thought, how am I writing this word in my sermon notes here this morning? But he was vomited out on dry land. He was back where he started, but he had lost his money. He had lost his possessions. He was at least partly beginning to be digested by a fish, and he was standing covered in fish vomit. You think he maybe was realizing he should have listened the first time, right? But God was doing all this because he was working on Jonah's heart. He was working on Jonah's life. If the possessions were going to get in the way, God was going to take them away. If his help was going to get in the way, God was going to take them away. If his comfort was going to get in the way, God was going to take that away until he made Jonah into the man of God that, jo that God wanted him to be. And Jonah, here we see results of running from God, wasted time, wasted resources, but then Jonah hits rock bottom, doesn't he? Or maybe you call it fish bottom. He's there in the fish hitting rock bottom. Before we even see that in chapter 1, verse 5, where was he in the ship? He was in the lowest parts of the ship. I think symbolically, it's like saying, I'm going into the lowest parts that I can find. I'm getting away from everybody. I'm going to sit in this dark corner by myself. And what was he doing? He was sleeping. What do people do when they're depressed? Maybe you've been through that. Maybe you're in that. Maybe you're battling with it right now. What do they do? What do we do? We go to sleep. I don't care. I don't care if the ship goes down. I really don't care. I'm going to sleep. Leave me alone. I'm going to the deepest, darkest part that I can find. I'm just going to lay here. He was ex exhausted. He was stressed. He was depressed. That's not a normal thing to do. He was wrestling with some things in his heart, and he had flat given up. I'm going to the deepest part of the ship. We see death as they threw him into the ocean. Jonah would rather die than repent or obey God at this point. They threw him overboard. This was essentially a death sentence, and bitterness will cost you. As we see, it brought him to the point where he didn't even care anymore. He was willing to die. And that really dark place, that darkness as he was swallowed up by the fish. Let's read chapter 2, verses 2 through 10 together in the fish. And Jonah said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me. Out of the belly of the grave I called to him, and he heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. Your billows and your waves, they passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters surround me even to my soul. The deep has enclosed around me. Listen to this detail. 
Seaweeds are wrapped around my head. That's scary. He can't see. He can hardly move. He can feel the waves kind of hitting the waters, kind of hitting the side of that fish, like the billows just pounding into him. And he's afraid. He can't see his hand in front of his face. He's got seaweed wrapped around his body. I'm not proud to tell you today that I'm that guy. I love swimming in the ocean. But when a piece of seaweed touches my foot, I get a little panic going on. He's got it wrapped around his whole body, wrapped around his head. I went down to the moorings of the mountain. The earth and its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord. My God, when my soul fainted within me, that's a key phrase. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. What did it take for Jonah to turn back to God? It took him getting to the end of himself, didn't it? A lot like Job. Job gets to the end of himself and then he has a breakthrough. And if you're wrestling with some things, some depression, exhaustion, stress, unforgiveness, a lot of times we just need to get to the end of ourself and then God is going to do something glorious. God is going to break us free. When my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord. And my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you. With the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah on dry ground. Jonah hit that rock bottom, that depression, that place where he didn't care if he died, that deep darkness. God brought Jonah even lower than Jonah thought he could go, and then Jonah gets to the end of himself. He had given up, but God had not given up on him. And there he was in the belly of that fish, and he calls out to God, it says, when Jonah got to the end of himself, when his soul fainted within him, he had no strength, he had nothing left to stand on, he didn't have enough strength to be rebellious anymore, and he finally called out to God. That's when he said, God, I'll remember, I'll turn back to you. I remember the Lord. He thought of the Lord, who was brought to his mind, and Jonah called out for salvation. He said, I will sacrifice. That's his form of worship. He says, I gave thanksgiving. He was grateful to be alive. He said to God, I will pay my vow. What did he mean by that? I'm ready to obey. I'll obey. You are the God of salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah wanted to die, but God knew better, and God preserved him. God restores Jonah when Jonah repents as the fish spit him out, and God gives Jonah a second chance. There's always an easy escape when we want to rebel from God. When we want to do what's wrong, there's always something there waiting for us. But running from God will only cost us unnecessarily, won't it? It'll cost us time, it'll cost us money, it will cost us our health, it will cost us all of these things, but even as it's costing us that, where is our destination? Where is the ultimate goal in running from God? Where does that lead us? It leads us to depression, it leads us to darkness, it leads us to death. So if you're kind of wrestling with God, if you're in rebellion from God, say, where, what's the end game? Where is this whole thing leading me? If I get what I want, what is it? depression it's darkness it's death but fortunately god is salvation jonah wanted to die but god knew better and even as we rebel god is still calling for us god is still calling for jonah he is with us in our darkest times he's with us in our darkest places and god gives second chances third chances two hundred thousand chances most of us are probably in that 200 to 300 thousand range for second chances God is gracious. God is merciful. And even when we are in rebellion, his calling for us is still in place. And he is still working on us. And he is still calling for us. And he is still doing whatever it takes us to bring us to that point where we say, God, I will pay my vow. I will live out this calling that you have for me. How do we meet with that mercy? How did Jonah meet with that mercy? How did the Assyrians meet with mercy? It's kind of the same in both of them. But we see in chapter 3, and I'll paraphrase it and give you the verses. Jonah goes and he preaches. God said, it's kind of funny to me, go preach to Nineveh. And Jonah runs and he goes through all this stuff and loses everything. And then he spit out and he's standing there soaking wet, exhausted. I'm sure he was hungry. He was tired. He was probably feeling miserable, getting the seaweed out from all the crevices of his body. And then God says, Jonah, I still want you to go to Nineveh. Nothing had changed. The calling of God hadn't changed. Your rebellion doesn't change God's calling on your life. He still has a plan and a purpose. But how do we meet with that mercy? He preaches. The people repent. They put on sackcloth. They put on the ashes. They call out to God. They repent of their evil ways, and God forgives them. But how did all that happen? I'm paraphrasing chapter 3. In verse 4, Jonah preached, and they heard the word of God. How do we meet with God's mercy? You need grace. You need mercy. Hear the word of God. 
They heard the word of God preached by Jonah. Secondly, they believed the word of God in verse 5. They believed the Hebrew word anon, to trust, to establish. The root word comes from a uh, word meaning to place in your right hand. In other words, I believe this, I'm holding on to it with my strength, and I'm going to be active with it. They believed. They heard the word. They believed the word of God. And thirdly, in chapter 3, verse 8, they repented. They began fasting. Uh, they put on the sackcloth, which we don't necessarily do that anymore. But it basically is a symbol of true remorse. Like, I'm not just upset that I got caught, but I'm really upset for who I've been, and I need to change. And they were repenting before God, turning from their sin. Uh, we see the king declare that they're going to make a change. They're going to make changes uh, before the Lord God, the Lord of Israel. And they make that 180-degree turn. And God responds in verse 10 with mercy, with forgiveness. Even the worst sin can be forgiven. There's mercy for you, and there's mercy for me. You don't need to get what you deserve. We deserve the judgment of God, but we don't need to get that. The Ninevites deserve the judgment of God. Jonah deserved the judgment of God, but we don't need to get what we deserve. God is gracious, and God is merciful. And lastly this morning, how does the whole thing end? We know in chapter 3 the Ninevites repent and God forgives them. He doesn't destroy them like he said he was going to destroy them. But the book of Jonah and the life of Jonah, as far as we're concerned, has an open ending. It doesn't really say who Jonah went on to be after that. Let's read it together. Chapter 4, we'll read the whole chapter. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So this is kind of where we started. He became angry that they were forgiven. He prayed to the Lord, and he said, Ah, Lord, is this not what I said when I was in my country? Therefore I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. You'd think he'd be saying that with a nice tone, right? Like, I knew you were gracious. I knew you were merciful. I knew you were loving, and you would relent from doing harm. But he's saying, I knew it. I knew you wouldn't get him in trouble. I knew that they'd get off the hook. He was upset. Verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please, here we go again, take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Is it safe to say that Jonah is still wrestling with some bitterness? He is. So Jonah went out of the city, and he sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter, and he sat under it in the shade until he might see what would become of the city. What's he doing here? Doesn't he already know what would become of the city? He just said it. You forgave them. I knew you would do this. And then he goes and he sits and he pouts. What's he doing? He's trying to manipulate God. He said, I knew you wouldn't do it. I knew you couldn't. I knew it's not who you are. You could never do that. And then he goes and he sits and he watches to see if God would say, you know what, I can. Here it goes. He was trying to manipulate God, but we know that God is not one to be manipulated. And the Lord God actually kind of does the opposite. Prepared a plant that it might be grow up behind Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. What does God do? He blesses Jonah. Jonah's still embittered. He's still in rebellion. He's still kind of pushing at God, arguing with God, working on this relationship with God. And it says Jonah was very grateful for this plant. So Jonah starts to calm down, has a change of heart. I'm grateful, God. I'm grateful for this plant. But God has a lesson for him ahead. Verse 7. But as the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. So it damaged the plant so that it withered. And it happened that when the sun arose, that God prepared a violent east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself, and he said, It is better for me to die than to live. And then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about this plant? And Jonah said, It is right for me to be angry, even unto death. Wow. I love in this passage how God just keeps working with Jonah. Don't you love that? Because a lot of us are a lot like Jonah. And, and I know we kind of like, we kind of smirk at, wow, Jonah is just really upset. But you know they, what they did to his family, what they did to his friends? I don't know that we could blame him. But nonetheless, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah said, yes, it is right. Reminded me of my daughter when she got grumpy the other day, two-year-old. And I said to her, is your name Brookie Koa or is your name Grumpy Stumpy? And she folded her hands and, and furrowed her brow and said, My name is Grumpy Stumpy. And I said, Oh, really? I said, Is it fun for you to be grumpy? 
And she said, yes, it's fun. And then she went and put herself on timeout. She puts herself on timeout now. She'll say, I'm going on timeout. And she'll go sit in her chair. She knows it's coming. So she goes. But it kind of reminded me, is it right for you to be angry? Yes, it's right for me to be angry. About the plant? Yes, about the plant. And the Lord says to Jonah, you have pity on a plant. You didn't work for it. You didn't make it grow. It came up in a night, and then it died in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, with more than 120,000 people, and they cannot discern between their right hand and their left? And he says something about the livestock. That's the end of the book. It has an open ending, doesn't it? We don't really know where Jonah ended up here. We do see at the beginning of this passage, and the point God made is, is, is brilliant. You pity this plant, and you didn't work for it, you didn't do anything for it. Shouldn't I pity these people? I love them. I created them. There's 120,000 of them. I love each and every one of them, and I see how lost they are. They're violent, they're evil, they're wicked, but they need someone to tell them. They don't know better. They need someone to preach to them. And Jonah did, and they repented, and they were saved. They were given the grace and mercy of God. But Jonah is still bitter, but God is still good. We're going to do a little back and forth thing, so you can jot them down if you want. Verse 1, Jonah is still bitter, but we see in verse 2 that even though Jonah is still bitter, God is still good. God's mercy is so consistent that it's predictable. We can predict it. There's a lot of things that we can't predict about God. A lot of things we don't understand about God. But something we can predict. He's so consistent that we can predict His grace and we can predict His mercy, right? If someone calls out to God and says, God, forgive me. I desire your grace. I desire your mercy. What is He going to do 100 times out of 100? He's going to be gracious and He's going to be merciful. He's so consistent, it's predictable. Where's Pastor Mark? 445 in the morning. You know, when I was training for marathons, I jogged by his house. What's that man doing? And he's sitting in his front yard praying, looking at the stars, right? So, so consistent, it's predictable. A lot of you are like that. I'm sure I'm getting like that. So consistent, it's predictable. When I was in sixth grade, uh, I went to an English class. It was the only class where the teacher didn't assign seats because the other ones, they assigned seats for control because they keep the bad kids away from the other bad kids, and I was a good kid, so I always had to sit next to, like, the worst kid. But in this class, you could sit wherever you wanted. Now, I remember on the first day of class, someone sat in the back right corner. And the biggest kid, his name was Ed, big, mean kid. I mean, way bigger than all the other kids, probably way older than the other kids, but I'm not sure. And he came, you know, waltzing in there to the back corner, just looks at the kid sitting in the back corner desk. That's where he wanted to sit. And he didn't say a word to him. He just took the desk with both his hands and flipped the desk over, and the kid fell because the desk was attached to the chair. That's the kind of guy this guy was. And he picked on everybody. Nobody liked him. He was a bully. I remember one winter day, he took a kid's hat off his head, a little guy, and, uh, and opened the window, third story of the, the school was upstate New York, different types of buildings than we have here, threw it out the window, down into the snow, third floor. And I remember thinking, man, that was messed up. And I saw the snow there on the, the windowsill, and I had an idea. And the next day, this kid doesn't know me from Adam. He doesn't know who I am, doesn't even know I exist. And I'm a good kid. I never get in trouble. But I scooped some snow off of that ledge, and I thought it'd be funny. I know where he's going to sit. Everyone kind of sits in different seats. That kid sits back right corner every time. I put snow on his seat, and the heater melted it pretty quick. I thought it was funny. He comes waltzing, and he sits down, and his pants get all wet. And he gets, he gets really upset about that and frustrated. I can see him going like this and standing up and kind of looking around like, what in the world? I did that for three or four days in a row, and then the weekend came. I did that into the next week, and the kid would forget every time. He'd keep, and I'd kind of sit and kind of watch and think, oh, is he going to sit in it? Is he going to sit in it? And then he would come waltzing in, and he'd sit in, and his pants would get all wet, and he'd start smacking the desk. He'd get upset, and he, he was upset at himself for forgetting, and then just baffled by, why is my seat always wet? Until one day, he came in as I was placing the snow on his chair. And I saw him placing the snow on my chair. I saw him seeing me do it. And lucky for me, there's two doors to that room. I ran out the back door. I'm much quicker than him. He comes running from the front door. I'm running through the crowded halls because it's indoor hallways, not like it is here. And I'm pushing people out of the way, and I'm running. And I run into the bathroom thinking he didn't see me, but then I see the door open. I bolt into the stall, and he comes in the stall. He's shaking the door. It's almost like a movie. And as the door opens, I slide under the stall, into the stall next to me. He comes in, and he can't go under. And by the time he turns, I'm back out the door, and I sat close to the teacher for the rest of the semester. The gig was up. But he was so consistent, it was predictable. He was mean, he was gnarly, he was nasty, and he sat in that seat every single day. I knew where he would sit. And in an opposite way, but that was kind of funny anyway. 
God is so consistent, it's predictable. You got some stuff going on. If you come to him asking for mercy and grace, what's he going to give you? Mercy and grace. You run in rebellion, what's he going to do? Just give up? Not that easy, right? He's going to keep following after. He's going to keep working on you. Jonah is still bitter. God is still good. Jonah gave up on God. Verse 3, we see that. God, you didn't do what I wanted you to do. I want to die. You're not listening to me. He gave up on God's plan for the future, but God had not given up on Jonah. Jonah gave up on God. God wouldn't give up on Jonah. He's still teaching Jonah. Jonah's still trying to manipulate, still trying to find that place with God, but God is still working on him. God is still molding him. He grew that plant to deliver Jonah from his misery. He, deliver, he let the worm go to show him a picture of his bitterness, that it's going to ruin all the comfort in your life. I gave you something, but your bitterness is going to ruin it. And the same is true for us, that God wants to deliver us from our misery, but our bitterness and our anger is going to ruin that. It's going to ruin the comfort that God wants to give. And then he allows the sun, and he brings the east wind to start this whole process over again. Jonah, you didn't quite get it with the whale. I thought that would break you down, and that would change your heart, but it didn't. So let's try it with this sun and this wind. And the sun just beats on him and the wind, and he's wearing Jonah out again because he wants to start it all over again. I have faith for Jonah's life because God's not giving up on him, right? Say, well, how does Jonah's life end? How does the story end? Well, I don't know. It doesn't say it, but God's not giving up. That's pretty clear, right? God is still teaching him. God is still doing miraculous things to show him who he is and what he desires of him. But Jonah's still angry. God is still loving. Didn't change God. The book has an open ending. Legend has it. It's kind of one of those, you know, Peter crucified upside down things. There's no historical documentation. It's kind of a kind of a Christian legend that Jonah did have a change of heart and that he did go on to live for a time among the Ninevites, that he did become sort of a hero to them. We don't know that. It's not provable. It's very unconfirmed. It doesn't really matter this morning, though. We don't know whether his heart was changed or not. I have great faith that it was simply because I know who God is and God wasn't going to give up. But if we could have the worship team come forward, our lives also have an open ending, don't they? Each and every one of us sitting in this room is still alive. I'm looking around to make sure of that. We're all still here. What does that mean? That means that your book has an open ending. That God's calling for your life is still there. That if we got some things we need to work on on our heart, God's still working with us. The book is still open. The ending hasn't been written. If you're bitter, God is still good. If you've given up on God, maybe walked away from your calling, He has not given up on you. We see with Jonah, He's going to keep doing this over and over again until Jonah has it right. If you're angry, God still loves. No matter what you've done or become, no matter what's in your heart, your life still has an open ending. Aren't you grateful for that? That what's past is past, and we can all move on into a different future. God is not done working on us, is He? Not a one of us. He's still working on each and every one of us. So let's respond to him today. If you need to forgive, forgive. If you need to let go, let go. If you need to ask God for love in your heart for someone, let's do that here this morning. If you need to change directions, change how you're living your life, your walk with God, let's do that this morning. The life of Jonah, what a great lesson it is for us. Let's stand and worship.